we did a reality show called Pig Little Lies, the world's first reality TV show starring pigs. We work with a great producer, Eamon McChrystal of Inspired. He said to me, if you want a hit show, that's going to change your network. One hit show. <laughs> so I said, okay. I call my friend Simone Reyes, who's been in reality TV. And I said, Simone, we need a reality show. And she said, I can't talk right now, Jane. I've got two pigs in a high kill shelter. They're going to, they only have hours to live. We've got to get them out by tonight. I said, oh my God. That's our reality show. Everything can't be just go vegan the second that people join. Get them in the tent, but bake in the message. Mm -hmm. So we want to create entertaining content. Like I said, you should have a reality show. Uh-oh. Might be a little out of control. Exactly. That's what we want. A little out of control. I could have a reality show just on my night last night. <laughs>
wherever people are on the journey, we're going to accept them right from there and then move forward. So I went to NYU and then I became a reporter starting in Fort Myers, Florida, my first job, and then Minneapolis, then Philadelphia. And along the line, uh, somebody sent me a, a horrific cassette with video of head injury experiments being done on primates at a university in Pennsylvania. And I was horrified. And I just said, this is evil. This is evil. We've got to stop it. And I didn't know exactly how to stop it. But later in my career, I then went to New York, worked as a reporter and anchor at uh, WCBS TV, right on my home street, 57th Street, for eight years. Then I got a job out here uh, in Los Angeles at KCAL TV, which was great. It was right on the Paramount lot. I had a great spot on the Paramount lot parking lot, which was, <laughs> you had to have been there. It was a good thing. And it was just so much fun. I worked there for 12 years and you, know, you got Klingons walking by and then a movie star and you go to the cafeteria and there's like, it was just great. It was really old Hollywood and I'll always treasure my time there. And while I was there, um, this guy comes in to do an interview and he had been on Oprah. He was a fourth generation cattle rancher named Howard Lyman, and he got really sick. And he, as he went into surgery, this is what I hear, the legend has it, he made a pact with God and said, if you get me out of this alive, I'm going to reveal the horrors of the cattle industry. He survived. He went on Oprah, and she famously at one point said, that just stopped me cold from eating another burger. When he revealed the horror, she was sued by cattlemen. She had to move her show to Texas for a while. That's how Dr. Phil, I believe, got into the picture of media. Anyway, he was a he, he was a cause celeb for, for a period of time, and he'd written a book called Mad Cowboy. So I interviewed him. And he was telling us all about the horrors, babies stripped from their mothers and boy calves shot, left for dead, put in veal crates. And after the interview, he walked up to me with his publicist, a very hardcore activist who I love, <laughs> later came to be friends with Mar Nealon. And they looked at me and they said, we hear you're a vegetarian. And I said, yes, at that point I was a vegetarian. They said, do you eat dairy? And I hung my head because he had just said all of that. And I said, yes. And they went, liquid meat, like that, right in my nose. Liquid meat. <laughs> that was the moment I went vegan. Now, if they had just said, well, I think you should possibly consider cutting back on your dairy, I wouldn't have heard it. But so when people say, don't ever confront. No, if they hadn't confronted me, I might not have made the change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were very forceful. Fingers to the nose, liquid meat. And you know, God bless them. I am so thankful that they confronted me about my hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, about a month, it takes about a month for your taste buds to return to their factory settings. About a month later, I used to love cheese. I was at uh, a restaurant, somebody put cheese on my salad. I tasted, <sighs> my taste buds had completely changed. I noticed that that happened with me too. It's like you kind of start to enjoy the taste of vegetables mm -hmm. and fresh fruit more so. You don't need all that oil. And sometimes if I go out to eat, I'm like, this has way too much salt in it or way too much oil. You may not feel the same way about salt. Jane likes <laughs> to put salt on everything. But uh, your taste buds really do reset. And mm. when it comes to liquid meat, just for those of you that are watching that may not understand what that means, uh, the dairy industry is the meat industry. And it's because baby cows are killed in the dairy industry. So mother cows are artificially inseminated. Nine months later, when they give birth, they're separated from their young. Mm. The baby boys are taken to veal crates where they're raised for a few weeks for slaughter and then the females will live the same life as their mothers producing babies and then they are also slaughtered in the end so a lot of slaughterhouses that i've been to they're filled with dairy cows yeah they turn them into a cheap hamburger which is subsidized by the u.s government shamefully while the u.s government says it wants to combat climate change and animal agriculture is a leading cause of climate change and habitat destruction, wildlife extinction, not to mention human world hunger, and preventable lifestyle diseases like heart disease and cancer. There is one underlying false assumption that is at the root of 90% of the world's problems, and that is that we have to kill to survive. And this is really the most important social justice movement of our time, 
of ever because it covers everyone and everything. If we don't figure this out, we're not going to have a livable planet and it's going to happen very quickly. And so what we're doing at Unshamed TV, thanks to generous filmmakers and content creators who give us their videos, their documentaries, uh, nobody, we don't pay anything. That's how we're able to do it. I mean, these networks, these big networks are spending literally billions of dollars to create streaming platforms. We created ours for tens of thousands of dollars and we run it thanks to volunteers and people are giving us their content. I don't take a salary. Um, we have volunteer this, that, and the others going live all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we're also covering trials that other people ignore, like the trial of, uh, Wayne Shung and Paul Picklesheimer in Utah, which they went into a ginormous factory farm. The video is so horrifying. And because they sometimes say, well, you took the video out of context, they actually got high tech 360 degree cameras that followed them in 360 degree fashion through their entire examination of this hellhole. And they took two sick piglets out and they were put on trial in Utah and they were acquitted. And it was huge. It was one of the best moments of Unchained TV live as the verdict came down. We had attorneys as well as activists, members of direct action everywhere on the ground. And, you know, we were able to capture that live. That's a big story. And why mm -hmm. wasn't the New York Times, actually the New York Times, let's give credit where credit is due. They did, uh, they have covered a lot of direct action everywhere stories and they did um, have an opinion piece after that. So we have to say that there are exceptions to the rule, but overall the news media is not covering this movement. And that's why we're doing an end run around the mainstream media and putting this out on streaming, which has overtaken broadcasting cable as the number one way people are watching television. Mm -hmm. So with this channel, with Unchained TV, what are you hoping to do? Are you hoping to reach more non-vegans? Are you hoping to give vegans a space where our stories can be told? Are you trying to document history? Like what is it that is the goal with Unchained TV? All of TV? that, all of that. I mean, we have to, you know, if a tree falls and no one hears it, does it make a sound? Uh, so we want to cover just this week, we covered 11 Canadian activists who uh, went into a pig hellhole in Canada and live streamed it. So, you know, when people are trying to commit crimes, they generally don't live stream their crimes. And uh, they showed this horrific footage and they just said, we want, we want somebody mm -hmm. in government and media to acknowledge this and do something about it. They were arrested. Um, they were convicted and they were supposed to be sentenced today. This happened in 2019 and they postponed their sentencing. And so they're in legal limbo. One of the people is suffering from PTSD. I mean, why are we punishing the people who are showing us stuff that outrages everybody? Even the judge said that the images were disturbing. And so why punish the people who brought you the images? This is what we have to get out. And it's not like we're just rah, 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 but we have a viewpoint just like MSNBC has a viewpoint and Fox news has a viewpoint. We have a viewpoint and our viewpoint is animals are not things. They are not mere property. They are sentient beings that deserve rights. And so we cover things like the non-human rights project, trying to get habeas corpus for an elephant that's trapped in the Bronx zoo. And, uh, you know, that went all the way up to the highest court in New York state and they didn't win, but they had two very, strong dissents from two judges. It's a process. We mm -hmm. just got to keep going. As Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. It really goes to show what are these industries trying to hide to the point where they will go as far as imprisoning whistleblowers and activists for just simply documenting the conditions. I mean, you are seeing pigs in cages with feces that are oh. up to their legs. Oh. I mean, they are unable to breathe in these pneumonia ridden sheds. They are in the dark. They have never seen the light of day. It's like, what, what did they do to deserve this? These innocent little baby animals that would show us love and show us kindness we can find them torture them and then murder them and if we did it to dogs like my little rescues here sunday and wednesday people would be running in the streets mm -hmm. screaming and you'd be thrown in jail 
So why, as Dr. Melanie Joy says, you know, why do we love some animals and eat others? Mm -hmm. And so this is such a fundamental thing. It's really about evolution. You know, I was filling out a form yesterday and they said, who are your top competitors and why are you better than them? And I responded, I am totally in support of other people doing this media and collaborate with them constantly and wish them the best because we have the same mission. So um, just in gratitude to Gen V for um, allowing us to stream their videos. We've worked with Plant-Based News, we've Veg Magazine, Veg Out Magazine, Veg News. Um, you know, all of these, even the Dodo, which are obviously highly successful, um, it takes a very soft approach, but all spokes in the wheel. So, and you know, it was funny because the same thing was said by the head of Impossible Foods where somebody came up to him and said, your top competitor beyond meat. He said, hold on, I don't consider them a competitor. We have the same mission. Mm -hmm. See, this is the vegan outlook. The vegan outlook is win-win. The carnist outlook is for me to win, you've got to lose. And that is a pr primitive outlook. So this is really about evolution. Mm -hmm. Our movement is about our species has to evolve or we are going to very likely have an unlivable planet and we can go extinct. And I know it sounds cray cray, but it's not me saying this. Sir David Attenborough has an incredible documentary on one of the big streaming channels called Breaking Boundaries. You got to watch it because it's terrifying. There's only a handful of uh, boundaries. Once you cross them, there's no going back. Once the ice caps melt, you can't buy new ice caps off of Amazon, okay? So that's a done deal. And that when you really think about what's happening, it is, it is terrifying. And we are offering the solution. And that's why we've got to get it out there. A lot of times there's a vegan echo chamber. How many times have you gone to a screening where you look around and everybody in the room is already vegan? And now we all sit down and watch some gruesome footage. Well, we already know that. We don't need to see it. We don't need to traumatize ourselves again. We need to reach people who don't have access. So why is this different from YouTube? Well, generally when I'm on YouTube, I'm looking for something, usually an instructional video on how to, <laughs> how to make something <laughs> technical work. But it, no matter what it is, I'm looking for it. This is people looking for free content. You know, there's now billions of streaming device users out there. And the number one search term is free. That's why we offer everything for free. So we don't even require a subscription. It's free to download. You can download it on your phone. You can watch it online at unchainedtv.com. You can download it on your TV via Am your Amazon Fire Stick, your Apple TV device, your Roku device, and it's about to go on all Samsung smart TVs. So we want to reach people who are looking for free content. You know, you probably have a couple of subscriptions, right? I have um, Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, and BritBox, I happen to like BritBox, but uh, maybe it's my crime days. I love the, <laughs> I love the Poirot um, and Sherlock Holmes, but- um, And Succession. Oh, Succession, <laughs> well, that's the HBO. Yeah, that's brilliant. She made brilliant. me watch it the other day and I, <laughs> I fell asleep. It's so I was brilliant. <laughs> I can't believe you fell asleep. But um, in any case, um, we're trying to reach people looking for free content. Those are the people who need this information. The information is out there. It's on the streaming app. It's if you Google what happens to pigs in gestation crates, it's out there. So it's really frustrating that more people haven't changed yet. So when you first made the connection and you first learned this, how did you then take a step towards speaking out against this? It's really difficult being a journalist because you have to kind of come from an objective point of view. Talk a little bit about the pushback that you got. <laughs> well, I started, I was already a pain in the ass. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> but I started doing things like going around the newsroom and removing all the glue traps. And I got into fights with people. They're like, what the hell are you doing? Are you out of your mind? I'm like, these are torture devices. Then I started saying, I'm not going to read this kicker story, like a rodeo kicker story. And I'm like, do you know that they tie ropes and around their testicles and their gonads to make them jump up? Like you think a, a bull's just going to jump up like that for no reason. And they hit him with electric prop. And I remember one news director, stick to the copy. Um, but I did my, make myself uh, an irritant by bringing these issues up. And, um, you know, people looked at me like I was a little crazy. But when you're too far ahead of the herd, as they say, I hope that's not speciesist, 
you know, you have to take some risks. And I really don't care if people uh, find me ridiculous because they've always found me ridiculous since childhood. So <laughs> it doesn't really matter. At least they're finding me ridiculous for a serious reason as opposed to <laughs> a non-serious reason. Now, um, things have changed a lot. You know, I used to go, I've been vegan now, something like 27 years. And I used to go into, I don't know the exact age. Like I'm also 28 years sober, knock on wood one day at a time. I know my exact sobriety date, which is April Fool's Day. Very appropriate because I made quite a fool of myself. We'll get into that. Yes, but I don't know my exact date. I've tried to like research it in terms of the date I went vegan um, because I didn't understand how important it was. Otherwise I would have probably gotten one of those tattoos, you know, or something. I don't have any tattoos, but, um, the point is that I didn't realize how important it was at that moment. Uh, but when I did go vegan all those years ago, something like 27 years ago, uh, I'd go into a vegan restaurant. Nobody else was there. I, I knew the waiter. I knew the maitre d'. I knew the chef. Now I go to a vegan restaurant. I can't get a table and nothing makes me happier to go to a gracias madre or someplace. And oh my God, we're, we're packed. The line's out the door. Sorry. Right. You tried to make a reservation yesterday. Couldn't even get in. Gracias madre and Nick, she couldn't get in. I was like, yay. <laughs> Sorry, but yay. I went to sugar taco, which was really, really oh, good. I love that. I love that place. And you found a new great vegan sushi Sushi's. place. Yep. I went to two dinners last night <laughs> <laughs> must be nice yeah. um but you know the point is that this has grown so much one of the reasons i love the vegan women's summit is that it's a whole bunch of new faces and they're approaching this movement from a totally different perspective mm -hmm. which is not you know protest which is where i come from is the hardcore animal rights activists, the protests, the marches, the sit-ins, the die-ins, the open rescues. Not that I've, I'm a bit of a coward. I haven't gotten arrested. I've, I'm, but all spokes of the wheel. It's not for, you know, yeah. like, I, I definitely could not be an undercover investigator. Oh, no, no, Absolutely. No, 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 Those no. are the heroes. The true heroes, the people who blow my mind are the people who go into these places and they are risking their lives, make no mistake. When I interviewed Raven Deerbrook, who, and it brings tears to my eyes when I think about this, she put on a worker's outfit, she went into the pig slaughterhouse here near downtown LA, she climbed down a ladder into the gas chamber, positioned uh, cameras and a transmitter near it, okay? and then was coming up and um, the gas was starting to affect her. And she said she had a moment where she didn't think she was gonna get out. And she climbed out and she's had nightmares. She, I mean, that's heroism. That is true heroism. And those people are, those are my heroes. And so, you know, I do work very hard around the clock. People think we have a giant building. We're connected to a post office box that has like an address, you know, the modern ones don't say PO box and there's a building and people will say, I've seen your headquarters. And <laughs> they're like, have your comms team contact our comms team. And I'm like, yes, sure. We'll do. So they think there's a lot, cause usually it's hundreds of people running a network and it's, you know, me and a handful of 90% volunteers, there's a couple of technical people that we pay, but very little independently, because this is a community network. I don't consider it mine. It's something that was started through our nonprofit, but it belongs to the vegan community. If your production values are at the level where it can appear on a streaming network and there's clearances for your content, you can put it up. We have a very simple release. So we uh, are inviting content creators from around the world, whether you have a cooking show or a talk show. We did a reality show called Pig Little Eyes, the world's first reality TV show starring pigs, Beatrice and Dante. And you know, I have to tell you the story of how it happened. So we work with a great producer, Eamon McChrystal of Inspired. He did our 20 episode uh, celebrity packed vegan cooking series, New Day, New Chef, which won two taste awards. He said to me, well, He's Irish. He said, well, if you want a hit show, you know, that's going to, that's going to change your network. One hit show, one hit show, establish Netflix with House of Cards. So I said, okay. I call my friend Simone Reyes, who's been in reality TV. And I said, Simone, 
We need a reality show. And she said, I can't talk right now, Jane. I've got two pigs in a high kill shelter. They're going to, they only have hours to live. We've got to get them out by tonight. I said, oh my God, that's our reality show. Swear to God. The only thing we recreated was that initial phone call right here. And it's a hit. I knew it was a hit when my neighbor comes running up to me. She's no vegan. She goes, what's happening with Beatrice, which is one of the pigs. So you have to get people in the tent first. I, you know, I say everything can't be just go vegan the second that people join. Get them in the tent, but bake in the message. Mm -hmm. So we want to create entertaining content. Like I said, you should have a reality show. Uh Uh-oh. Might be a little out of control. Exactly. That's what we want. A little out of control. I could have a reality show just on my night last night. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I'm saying. If we had followed you with cameras, wouldn't that have been fun? Yeah. Exploring, ending up in some art show galleries with some naked people. (laughs) I was not there. Jane wasn't there. (laughs) She wishes she was. (laughs) I was sitting at home on my computer, working on my computer very boringly. But I I wanted to say that one of the ways that I was able to combine my career with activism, because you asked me about that. Yep. So when I ended up going from KCAL to syndicated TV, which was a celebrity show called Celebrity Justice, um, I got the idea that I could start doing animal stories because in the morning, uh, Harvey Levin would have a call, like at 7, 7.30 in the morning, we would have a meeting in person. We had to have story ideas and he'd say, where's the celebrity, where's the justice? And so I had started going to PETA galas and really admiring the work of PETA. And so I called somebody from PETA PR and I was like, look, celebrities don't like us. They hang up from us. They hang up. They run away from us. Um, But maybe we can find some celebrities who have passions about particular animal issues. And sure enough, we started getting celebrities who literally would push their publicists aside to talk to us about Mm. one of their passions. My Ultimate example was when I heard that Robert Redford was going to be at the Natural Resources Defense Council's new green building in Santa Monica. And I had just gotten one of those mass letters from him about the military sonar impacting the whales. So I said, I, how about if I get Robert Redford? And, and they said, well, if you can get a one-on-one, which is like almost impossible. So I go there, I hide behind a dumpster in the back of the building. My cameraman is over there. I'm here with the wireless mic. Sure enough, in a red Thunderbird convertible looking every bit the movie star, up pulls Robert Redford. And I jump out from behind the dumpster and I say, Mr. Redford, I got your letter about the whales. And he just looks at me like... And goes in the building. He goes, who's that? And goes in the building. But he's such a nice guy. They had a news conference at the at the rooftop with all the heads, like studio heads. It was like a power <laughs> convergence. And he comes up to me. He says, young lady. I was a little bit young ladyish at the time. Um, and he said, I do want to answer your question, which I thought was wow, right? Yeah. Very nice. His publicists looked like they were going to jump out a window. They were like, ah! <laughs> So (laughs) he kind of just brushes that aside and he asks me all these, you know, he answers all my questions and he talks about the military sonar, which is a very serious issue. These whales, you know, they go mad. They're underwater and the sonar is impacting them. So finally he says, what do you think about the whales? By this time I've worked myself into a bit of a frenzy. And I said, Uh I said, I'm devastated. I think about them all the time. (laughs) (laughs) And then he, you could see him starting to back away. (laughs) (laughs) But I got my interview. (laughs) I need to find this clip and put this in here. Oh. (laughs) I think that one ended up on the editing room floor, to be honest with you. But I had worked myself into a bit of a frenzy at that time. Oh, my God. But I got my one-on-one with Robert Redford on a tabloid show. And was this your first time getting the animal rights topic into the mainstream? Well, yeah, at that show. I was able, and we got a Genesis Award from the Humane Society. We got a couple of those along the way. Um, And so that really inspired me. So... Then, 
After that show ended, I was actually out of work. I was doing some fill-in for Court TV, covering criminal trials. And uh, I also, during Celebrity Justice, I was covering the Michael Jackson case mm. in Santa Maria, California. And I was on CNN Headline News pretty much every night because I was a reporter for Nancy Grace show. And then after that show ended, I was filling in for Nancy Grace. And then all of a sudden, I was sitting at the table back there and I got a call, 2008, and they said, hi, you know, it's CNN executive. He says, how would you like your own show? I said, I would, yes. And he said, good, we're gonna call it Issues with Jane Velez Mitchell. I said, great, because I've got a lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I literally, he said, well, do the show from LA today and get on a plane and come to New York tomorrow. When I got the job, I said, would you mind if I did a little animal segment once a week? And they said, mm, well, we don't, we don't see a problem with that. Okay. So they probably thought I was going to do pet adoptions, which I did, mm -hmm. but I did hardcore animal rights for six years while I had my show. It's amazing. Every Friday, pig gestation crates, tail docking. And also showcasing some of the up and coming vegan products. Like I had Josh Tetrick on and he even told me from uh, just egg at the time, just Mayo. Okay. I, I was so excited about that product. I actually went home with my girlfriend and we did a just Mayo commercial. <laughs> <laughs> we were, and, and we sent it to him and he was like, thank you so much. Yes. But, Is but it was public? fun. Is this a public commercial? <laughs> I think it got, it ended up another editing room floor mm. event. But the point is that he was, he said, you know, that gave him some credibility when he was starting out. So we were able to do a lot on that show. We interviewed the organizations, many of the leaders of the organizations, um, Mercy for Animals, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so I was able to incorporate it. And then the last thing I'll say, probably not the last thing I'll say, but, um, when the show ended, it was a six year run, it ended. So I actually went to an executive and I said, what do you think I should do? I was at that age. I knew kind of like that was, you know, my high point. I didn't want to circle the drain. And she said, look, you love animals. Why don't you do something with that? So I felt very empowered. I left on great terms. I loved everybody I work with. Um, and they gave me all their social media. So that's when I started this nonprofit. Amazing. Oh, amazing. Yeah, you were so I, this is so inspiring, guys. And for those of you, whatever field that you're in, whether it's journalism, whether it's filmmaking, whether it's art, singing, you can find a way to tie in your passions with your careers. And I think that we all need to find our own lane because what Jane does, what I do, it's going to be different, but and it's going to reach different people and we need all of it. And I think it's so important when you're looking at journalism and when you're looking at stories, bad headlines can really cause a lot of issues and a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of fake news out there. And you see some headlines in the animal rights world where, oh, mother kills her baby because she only feeds him almond milk. You know, the mother keeps her baby on a vegan diet and then, yeah, the kid, the kid dies because he's only drinking almond milk. So you see headlines like this that fail to report on the other side of things. I mean, we were just talking about the other day, there's been some headlines in the news where you see somebody saying, oh, highly processed vegan meats are not good for you. But then they fail to report on the fact that meat, actual animal flesh meat is even worse for you. Processed meat is officially cancer causing, according to the World Health Organization. That includes bacon, that includes hot dogs, that includes deli slices. So when these, Hacks, you know, report that processed meat, processed plant meat, like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, uh, well, they're processed. Do they ever say that processed meat in the same article is officially cancer causing? So, I mean, this is outrageous carnist media, which means that essentially they're looking at it from the perspective of likely I'm a meat eater, and I'm gonna report on something that is, I'm gonna report in a way that doesn't make me have to look in the mirror. And this didn't, didn't just apply to this social justice movement. Mm -mm. All social justice movements face, media generally reflects, it doesn't push the envelope, it reflects societal patterns. It's a confirmation bias. And people also want plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. So there's so much, uh, fake labeling, words that mean nothing, humane, natural, you know? And um, 
this is really misinformation. And every time they go into a factory farm, just today, this morning I was researching, I'm doing an upcoming interview on an undercover investigation at a so-called, you know, humane farm that has revealed horrific, horrific footage. So it's mislabeling and it's um, misinformation and what people sometimes want is they just want to be able to see that label and say, okay, I don't have to worry about it. And we've got to bust through that Mm -hmm. because uh, there is no such thing as humane meat. There is no way to kill an animal who does not want to die. These are just labels that consumers will use to make themselves feel better about participating in these industries. It's very, very easy to paint an idyllic picture in your mind and say, oh, well, if the cow lived a great life and had a name and was brushed a hundred times a night or whatever, and then... Uh, and none of that happens. And none of that actually happens, but not only that, but it's like it's almost like the ultimate act of betrayal because you have this cow that values its life, that loves you, that doesn't think that you would ever cause any harm to them, but then you go and drop them off at the slaughterhouse. It's like, who, who would do that to somebody that you love? Well, I mean, these are factory farms. They're concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs. They're not... This, this, also this idea of this individual farmer, you know, out of the movies. That's, I mean, you know, maybe one estate or two estate. I mean, the vast majority of, for example, I was just reading, ninety nine percent of chickens are factory farmed. I mean, that's mm-hmm. it. So people go, oh, well, I'm very careful about where I get my eggs or my meat, or it's, it's just you're lying to yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and and that's how. Um, society continues to justify what is completely unjustifiable. But I do believe in change and I am optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I do feel that there's going to be a convergence of environmental factors and business factors that is going to have a fundamental, um, it's gonna cause a fundamental shift. Uh, I was, I actually saw this TikTok video last summer thousands of cows dead on the side of the road Ugh. in Kansas and somebody had just taken their phone and videotaped as they were driving it was horrifying but remember those cows were going to die anyway and they died from heat and drought so um there are a lot of ranchers and farmers who as climate change gets more intense with the floods and the tornadoes and the extreme heat and the drought it's becoming harder for them to keep their operations, their animal agriculture going. Mm -hmm. Then you have the other thing, which is the rise of uh, clean meat, plant-based alternatives, which are, you know, I always say, well, it's processed. Well, you know what? Take a banana and a mango, put it in your uh, Cuisinart, and that's processed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's unhealthy for you. It's not an automatic. Um, So uh, there's those plant-based meats. Those are being accepted more widely. And and that's why they've declared war on them because people were starting to eat them and say, hey, it tastes, in in many cases, identical. They've done taste tests where they can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Or they actually say the one that's plant-based is meat and the one that's meat is (laughs) plant-based. They're almost or completely indistinguishable. Um, And so you have those plant-based meat alternatives. Then you have what I call clean meat, animal-free meat, um, which is, I don't like to use the phrase cell-based meat because it's not appetizing, but it's cultured meat. Mm-hmm. And that is they take either a tiny cell or a tiny little brush skin biopsy and they, they ferment it. And people go, ooh, well, cheese is fermented, beer is fermented, fermentation has existed for eons. There's nothing new about fermentation. And so that's also not going to have the antibiotics and all the other mm-hmm. things that are in meat today. I mean, antibiotic resistance is a huge problem because the overwhelming majority of antibiotics are fed to farmed animals because they're kept in such horrific conditions, they die otherwise, and also because it has the other effect of fattening them up more quickly. Yeah, and cultured meat is one of those things where you can grow a steak or a chicken leg or a wing and eat that instead of having to raise an entire living being, an entire animal, and kill them. And it's just, if you could get the same taste satisfaction, the same I, the same 
piece of meat. Why wouldn't you just do that? And I think it's really important to uh, realize that vegans don't care necessarily what you're eating. It's, it's important to realize that we just care if there's a victim at the end of the day. So for me personally, I feel so good on a whole foods plant-based diet that I don't know if I would really eat meat ever again from a cultured cell personally, but we're all for it. I mean, we are in total support of, of that technology. Yeah. I mean, uh, I saw it at the vegan women's summit. There were samples. I didn't personally eat it because I didn't grow up eating meat. So I'm not interested in it. But for those people, and we all know many of those people that no matter what you say to them about the health impacts, the environmental impacts, the fact that it's ugh, the reason why we have world hunger, because 80 billion animals raise for food every year and kill for food every year are eating a major portion of the food produced, which could go directly to children who are starving right now. So sometimes people say to me, well, I care about children. I care about children too. I don't want to see children starving to death. I also don't want to see kids who are extremely overweight in childhood because they're eating meat and dairy laden fast food. Mm -hmm. And that sets the, the template for their entire lives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, the whole system is out of whack. And the only thing really keeping it together is government subsidies. And this is what's so infuriating mm -hmm. is that the U.S. government purports to want to solve climate change. And yet, they are funding a new slaughterhouses. They are giving insurance to CAFOs that are wiped away uh, because of floods or tornadoes. Um, they are, the farm bill, which comes up for renewal in October, is giving billions of dollars of subsidies either directly to animal agriculture or to commodity crops that are um, growing crops to feed farmed animals. And, and Senator Cory Booker uh, did a great, uh, video on this saying, why can't we subsidize fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains that people are going to eat that's healthier for them? It's a crazy system and people have the, their blinders on, on this issue. And we've got to burst through that mm -hmm. bubble. People who are environmentalists should be vegan. Yep. People who are conservationists should be vegan. How many t have you ever been to, I was at a conservation event in Beverly Hills and oh. they're serving meat. And I, I went up to the head of the whole thing and I said, hello. The habitats are being destroyed yep. because of animal agriculture. Overwhelmingly, it's animal agriculture. Logging is a side product. And, and you know, that that's acknowledged for the Amazon, that it's animal ag cattle grazing. That is why the Amazon's, the lungs of the earth are being wiped out. And he looks at me and he just kind of like, I don't have time to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, you're ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> the cognitive like, dissonance. It's like, wake up. You call yourself an environmentalist, yet you are basically funding and uh, being a part of an industry that is killing the planet. It makes no sense. Choose a different cause. Why do you call yourself an environmentalist if you're eating animals? Pick a different cause because that is not your cause. I was reading one of these books that was written by an environmentalist, and he, he does to his credit, mentioned that animal agriculture is a very significant, you know, there's an argument you made it's the leading cause. Yes. Uh, and uh, Dr. Silas Rao, we did a documentary on him called Countdown to Year Zero, which is streaming on Amazon Prime, makes a very strong case and has written a white paper that makes a very strong argument that animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change. He's willing to debate anybody, anybody publicly at any time. Nobody's taken him up on it. So people say, you're wrong. And he says, okay, please, I, this is peer reviewed. It was published. Uh, in an Indian journal, and he said, well, people don't take it seriously because it's published in an Indian journalism, and he said, journal, and he says, that's neocolonialism. Yeah. So if it's only got to be published in the United States or Western Europe, in other words, to be taken seriously. So, you know, the meat and dairy industry is the ultimate example of neocolonialism. Um, first of all, cows and pigs are not indigenous to the Americas. The first cow came over, I believe, on Columbus's second voyage. The, the first pig came over uh, a Spanish conquistador in, I think, uh, 1532 or something mm. of that nature. They're not indigenous to the Americas. Okay, so by telling people and the global majority, the BIPOC community is overwhelmingly lactose intolerant, mm, you yeah. know, and yet we force these kids to drink milk, cow's milk in school. I mean, it's a crazy mixed up system mm -hmm. and we've got to get the word out. See, one of the most important things about Unchained TV is that it's long form content. It takes often more than 30 seconds or a minute 
to change somebody's mind. That's why powerful documentaries like Earthlings. Mm -hmm. And I went to Sean Munson and he, when I first started this, he was the first person mm -hmm. I contacted. And he said, of course, I'll give you Earthlings, you know, and he's my hero because so many people have gone vegan by seeing Earthlings and it's right up there. Me being one of them. Oh, well, there yeah. you go. Now, one minute of Earthlings might not have made you go vegan, but watching Earthlings yeah. makes you go vegan. So I even saw it myself. I was uploading content about composting because I want to broaden, as long as it's vegan, I want to broaden it so people who are interested in composting might come on. And I realized as I was uploading these videos and watching them, I was like, I'm a hypocrite. I'm not composting. Jane, you're uploading videos and you're not doing... So I started composting. Mm. I got a green bin for our building here. I um, have a pl plastic thing that is in my fridge where I put all my, you know, veg, whatever, banana peels, whatnot. And I started composting as a result of watching Unchained TV. It's the same thing if you watch three or four, six, seven cooking videos, by the time you're done, hey, you know, I can do this. It's also attraction, not promotion. Mm -hmm. We want people to realize this is no sacrifice. It is the most exciting and delicious adventure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think we really, uh, we just try to do better where we can, do you know? I'm, I'm always learning. I'm like, okay, well, if I can, be better by shutting the water off sooner or if I could be better by being aware about the electricity. Like there's always little things that can go a long way, but one of the biggest impacts that you can have is just at an individual level is going vegan and going plant-based. And I really do believe it, it, it is a spiritual awakening. And so when we talk about spiritual awakenings, you've had a few in your life. Well, <laughs> Take it I'm away. always careful about using the word spiritual, you know, like, I think there's a phrase called spiritual materialism where people kind of market their spirituality. So I don't want to be that person. I mean, I've got plenty of character defects and I can tell you every day I mess up some way, shape or form, at least once, maybe dozens of times. But um, I definitely, um, you know, I'm in recovery. Um, I uh, hit bottom at a party in Hollywood. Everybody was there and I was drinking and uh, blacked out and uh, made a complete ass of myself and, uh, you know, hit bottom. And uh, next day I sought out some help and have not had a drink, knock on wood. There's some wood here. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'll find Knock on my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, if for 28 years, one day at a time. So, um, that was definitely, um, you know, they say it's a spiritual problem with a spiritual solution. It's odd because I tried to willpower my way through that and it never worked. So, you know, the dichotomy is you surrender the only power you have over an addictive substance, whatever it is in my case, Chardonnay, you know, is um, to realize that you're powerless and stay away from it. And let me say, I wrote a book called Addict Nation, an Intervention for America, and you know, posit that we live in an addictogenic culture where there's no better customer than an addict. That's why they, fast food companies have packed their food with sugar, salt, and fat. Three ingredients we are pre-programmed to crave to get us through times of famine. And the other thing with addiction is it's never enough. You know, one drink is too many, a thousand isn't enough. So people are eating fast food, they eat it and then, oh, I got to have some more. I got to have some more. So there, you know, I believe it's an addiction. I do. And uh, there's a great book written by Dr. Neil Barnard called The Cheese Trap that makes a very strong argument that cheese is addictive mm -hmm. because it contains a substance that is designed to get the baby calf to drink the mother's milk. So we steal the milk and then we compress it into cheese, making that, that substance, that addictive substance, even more concentrated, which is one of the reasons why people say, I could never give up cheese. Well, now we have great cheeses. I mean, the cheeses are so good. Sometimes I do a double take. Is this really vegan? I got to check this out because mm -hmm. it really is so cheese-like. We have Miyoko's, we have Violife, we have Kite Hill, we have um, Follow Your Heart. I mean, yep. I don't want to leave anybody out because they're all 
they're all amazing. Mm -hmm. And they're only getting better. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it, people say that they're, they love cheese and that they can never give it up because they quite frankly are addicted to it. But I think we have to look at, is a baby cow's life more important than eating a piece of cheese? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So we need to definitely make changes with that. Um, yeah. I don't crave cheese at all. I mean, that's like uh, the lot. Well, I mean, I, I use the, you know, I mean, I use all those products that I mentioned and yeah. it's the same yeah. thing, you know? I mean, it's just, this is what's so frustrating is that when we didn't have alternatives, people said, what did you eat, grass? And then as soon as we create all these alternatives that mimic the foods that they've said they can never give up, then they say, well, it's processed. Right. See, whoever frames the debate wins the debate. So they're trying to put us in a no-win situation. What I learned attending the Vegan Women Summit is that there's an entire like newsroom sized um, headquarters where they send out disinformation and try to associate, you know, soy with ill health when in fact it's the best thing you can eat. It's a superfood. It, yeah. it reduces your chance of getting illnesses. And so there's a lot of misinformation yeah. being pumped out there. And unfortunately the media often picks up on it and just repeats it. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to do what we're doing. We have to do an end run. You know, somebody, when I, when I started this and uh, I first started going to uh, protests and stuff, and I'd say, oh, this is a great protest, but where's the media? Oh, we called them. They were going to come, but there was a breaking news story. Oh, my God. You know, now I know being a reporter for so many years, that's exactly what you say to somebody when you want to flake out because mm -hmm. there's always a breaking news story. You know, like it's always cocktail hour somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's always a breaking news story somewhere. So it's it's an excuse. So these these people were going to tremendous lengths doing these demonstrations. And at that point, you know, a lot of them weren't documenting it. It was just this before Facebook Live and all of that, um, you know, around uh, 2015. It, it just before Facebook Live changed everything because mm -hmm. we were able to just suddenly start going live. That's when we started doing our daily vegan cooking show, Lunch Break Live, which we did for about five years, getting millions and millions of views. Every day we did a Facebook Live vegan cooking show. And sometimes if people cancel at the last minute, I would have to do it. And then the kitchen would get set on fire and there'd be explosions <laughs> and all sorts. At one point I turned back and I was like, Did you I'm, use the stove? And, and the, the, my, uh, my cutting board was in flames. Oh my God. But in any case, it was always a laugh riot. It was always fun. And, and you know, we've actually been able to repurpose a lot of them mm -hmm. uh, and put them on Unchained TV because some of them were really good and we had celebrities doing them. Mm -hmm. So veganism to me, it's about living your truth. It's about aligning your morals with your actions. And you've done that in all three aspects of your life from your sexuality to alcoholism and recovery and veganism. So talk a little bit about how 28 years ago you had to look at yourself and be like, I need to just live my truth. Yes, and what happened was I got sober. And, you know, um, I'll always thank my boyfriend at the time. He was like, you need to get sober. And then I got sober and I realized as long as I could have another glass of Chardonnay, I didn't have to really look at myself. So I was drinking down my sexuality and I came out. Actually what happened, I was doing, uh, after a celebrity justice ended, I was doing freelance work here, there and everywhere. And I was on the radio here in Los Angeles. And we were talking about people being in the closet and, and we were talking about it. And um, my co-host was a log cabin Republican and he was talking about coming out. And then during, the commercial break, I just said, I feel so hypocritical. I'm living with a woman right now and I'm not talking about it at all. And I'm talking about somebody else's hypocrisy. And I, I just turned to him and I said, I just feel like such pressure. I feel so hypocritical. I think I have to come out. And he said, well, go for it. So I called my girlfriend at the time and I said, I'm coming out on the radio. Click. And you know, I just came out and it was devastating. Really? You know why? I feel like it would be freeing. Nobody really cared. And oh. so my oh. my boyfriend at the time said, it's worse than that, Jane. Nobody's thinking about you at all. <laughs> <laughs> so all that angst and anxiety and nobody really cared. Yeah. It was like, okay, maybe they talked about it for a week at the off. You know what I'm saying? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't such a big deal. It just makes you realize that when you're thinking about yourself, things seem so important and nobody's mm -hmm. they're thinking about themselves yeah. 
And so, you know, today's society is so much different. I mean, kids are so much more open. And of course, there's a backlash now, as we know. But I think it's all about being true to yourself. As Oscar Wilde said, be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Mm. And that I know because it's a refrigerator magnet. I, I saw it on your fridge. Yeah. I was going to say, where did I see that? Okay, makes sense. <laughs> I saw that and I said, that's my favorite quote ever. Be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. And you are so unapologetically you. I mean, you're so unique and different. And we love you, Jane. And we love Unchained TV. And so as we begin to wrap things up, I guess... Why don't you just share where everybody can download Unchained TV? It's all over the place. You can get it right on your cell phone. It doesn't matter what kind of cell phone you have. You just go to the app store and when you put it in, literally like 1,500 videos you can access. And the great thing is you can text it to people. So that crazy uncle who says, what do you eat? Grass? Boom. Text him you know, uh, Plant Pure Nation or Forks Over Knives. So it's really incredible. You can also get it online. You go to unshamedtv.com and just click watch now and it's there online. You can also watch it on your TV and it's really fun to watch on TV because it is just like Netflix and you can get it by using your Amazon Fire Stick, if you have one of those devices, or an Apple TV device or a Roku device. And it's going to be on all Samsung smart TVs like very soon. So just... Check it out there. And this is everything that's happening in the animal rights world, the animal rights scene. It's completely free. So be sure to download it. And I guess what's next for Unchained TV? Well, we're um, actually going to be debuting a whole bunch of shows. Uh, we want to do a lot of live contact. Uh, we have two doctors who are going to do a show called Dr. Moms, where they're going to answer questions from people and explain why, for example, you know, if you've had breast cancer, it's really good to have a plant-based diet and particularly certain things like uh, ground flaxseed that that can statistically help you to remain in remission and answer all sorts of questions that, that mothers have about their kids mm -hmm. um, and their kids' health. And so that's just one show. We have Elizabeth Alfano, who's this oh, incredible businesswoman. She's got a show on Unchained TV. And we have Plant Based in the Burbs. And we're going to unveil a surprise show that I'm working on that's going to be a lot of fun. And we want to have exciting content. So we really want a reality show. That is a very popular genre. And uh, we're just honing in on exactly, you know, um, when, the, when the idea hits, you know, bingo, like with Pig Little Eyes. It just, as soon as she said, I can't talk right now, I'm trying to rescue two pigs. They're gonna be killed tonight if we don't get them out. I was like, bingo. She had the passion. We had the plot. We had somebody who was, Simone Reyes is great. She's also a vegan country singer. So it appeals to Americana. So we're, we're, we're honing in on the next. And if you guys have ideas, if you have ideas about a reality TV show or you want to make a reality TV show, if you can get those production values up and, and believe it or not, I mean, we shoot a lot of content on the phone. It's unbelievable. These phones now have the same resolution and sometimes even better than certain cameras. And there are phone, there are, uh, there are audio devices that you can attach, which we have that give them crystal clear audio because mm -hmm. audio is one of the biggest challenges. So it doesn't mean you have to buy a bunch of expensive equipment. And so reach out to us, um, Jane at unchainedtv.com, uh, or just basically Instagram reach out to us. Instagram's the best way. If you have a show you want to do, you know, we've got many shows. We got Vintage Veg. These, these women reached out and said, we want to do something where we explore the history of comfort food and we veganize comfort food. And it's called Vintage Veg. And I was like, great. Mm -hmm. So we have their, um, um, lemon meringue pie recipe Ooh. that looks so good. I haven't made it yet, but it Maybe looks... Maybe we should make it this weekend. Oh my gosh. It's but... really good. And it's one of my faves, lemon meringue pie. Mm, amazing. Well, guys, definitely go check out Unchained TV. If It's one of those things where if mainstream media is not going to report on this, we're going to create our own app and we're going to report on it ourselves. So this is... Thank you for telling these important stories because I think it's one of those things that we're documenting this and this can be something that wakes other people up. For me, it was a lot of little messages 
was along the way. And then it was finally seeing the documentary Earthlings where I was like, okay, can't do this anymore. It's just not acceptable. And I don't want to be a part of torturing animals. So, yeah. And, you know, uh, we have now been around for a while. And when Ted Turner started CNN, everybody mocked him. Mm. And who had the last laugh? Ted Turner. Okay, so this is real, it's very powerful, and it has the ability to reach, at this point right now, potentially a third of the world's population. Because approximately three billion people have streaming devices, and there's eight billion people on the planet. So, you know, we're, we're really, really providing something that together, if we all get involved in it, could really be a game changer. Unchained TV. Amazing. Well, Jane Velez Mitchell, thank you so much for coming on Jamie's Corner today. Well, thank you, Jamie. I like your corner. <laughs> I like your corner, too. It's a cool too. corner. <laughs> so until next time, guys, I'm Jamie Logan. This is Jane Velez Mitchell, and uh, be well.